educated about how not only that this is happening, but how it affects us here, how it affects our national yeah. security, how it affects our taxpayer dollars, how it affects our southern border, Latin America, their presence there. Uh, but I also want to shift gears to get your thoughts on the uh, situation with Saudi Arabia. Very, very yeah. serious situation with Saudi Arabia. We originally dis decided that we're going to speak about this. Um, Dr. Ferris was um, the, the featured uh, expert in one of our pieces at the Foreign Desk that talks about um, renewing uh, relations between uh, Saudi Arabia and the United States. Just last week, we will um, link to that article as well. If you haven't had a chance to read it, it's very informative and thorough. Um, Dr. Ferris, my question to you is in the same week, we saw Saudi sending a, a representative to Mahmoud Abbas to the Palestinian uh, territories doubling down on uh, their support for a Palestinian state, saying East Jerusalem will be the capital. We support you. Uh, no human rights abuses against Palestinians. You guys are great. At the same time, the exact same time, Israel sends a uh, foreign minister. It was the tour tourism minister. Um, why not start with tourism uh, to Saudi Arabia? That is the first visit by an Israeli official to Saudi Arabia. What's going on here? Is Saudi Arabia <laughs> double dipping? Uh, and again, this comes right months after China brokered a deal between Saudi Arabia and Iran's regime, sworn enemies for 40 years. What's your take? And a, another amazing topic. So let's try to uh, look into it and then try to analyze, analyze it the, the best we can. What was new in the two actions that took place that you just mentioned? Saudi Arabia minister goes to the West Bank meet with the head of the PA, which they have done many, many, many times or an Israeli minister goes to Saudi Arabia and start talking about future collaboration. Obviously the second. Uh, let, me, let me take you with me to the inside of the, the kingdom or inside of the lead, leadership position. Mohammed bin Salman, the young uh, crown prince is committed completely for, and that's the most important to me, before even, before even a treaty with Israel is to change the radical movement inside Saudi Arabia, because if he doesn't do it, then nothing was going to happen. And actually, if Saudi Arabia does not defeat the Salafi and the neo-Wahhabi and the Muslim Brotherhood, who have been in control of a lot of sectors inside uh, Saudi Arabia, and they were behind a lot of radicalization around the world. And it's not just my analysis. I had hours of conversations with Saudi ministers as of 2016, 17, and so on and so forth. So the real battle in Saudi Arabia that we need to keep an eye on was and is Mohammed bin Salman reforms. Once he reformed the kingdom, once he defeat, utterly defeat the forces of jihadism and, and Islamism, then everything else is gonna go in that direction. Then the peace process with Israel will be very normal. Actually, MBS, Mohammed bin Salman, during that interview, the famous interview he had on Fox, which was broadcast all over the world, said clearly, we are talking with the Israelis. So that's different from the old Saudi Arabia that used to say, we're not gonna even talk before the Palestinian state. This is going. Now, we are talking with the Israelis. We need some concessions on some matters related to the Palestinian. That's because of the pressure of the, uh, of the Muslim world. But he said, at the end of the day, any, any process between us and the Israelis is gonna end up with a normalization, is gonna end up with a mutual recognition. Now, Problem is not in Saudi Arabia or in Israel. The problem is in Washington, D.C., because the administration for the last three years and the eight years of uh, the Obama administration were really putting a lot of pressure, a lot of pressure on Saudi Arabia and on MBS in particular. Even during the Trump administration, I remember they were putting pressure. That's the Congress, last two years of the Congress, and the media, Washington Post, New York Times, blasting MBS, so on and so forth, because because MBS was getting rid of two forces. One is containing the Iranians on the one hand, but more importantly, the Muslim Brotherhood on the inside mm -hmm. of, the, uh, of the kingdom. So I believe, if you ask me, I believe, let the Saudis do whatever they want in talking with the Palestinians. In my view, what they said to, to uh, Mahmoud Abbas is more important. They said, we're gonna get you concessions, but you're gonna get rid of Hamas. That's the bottom line, because there is no peace if Hamas is empowered, not just in Gaza, but also in parts of the West Bank. Okay, but I agree with everything you said. Of course I do, because we always agree on most things. I should say most things. Most elephant things. in the room, elephant in the room that doesn't fit the puzzle here, 
Nothing has truly changed in the region. For 40 years, Saudi and Iran has been at each other's throats, creating proxies, fighting each other in different ways, and they continue to. Why did Saudi Arabia engage with Iran in the, in the deal that China brokered? That goes completely, that was the detour, right? Everything you're saying is on track. They were eventually working towards a normalization deal with Israel. They were moving closer to the United States because who cares what Biden says? He's seen on, he's going to move on, right? Because that true uh, foreign policy it, it brings us closer to Saudi because of the Abraham Accords, and it always will. That's the natural relationship, right? So Obama and and Biden being a blip in the map of foreign policy because they love Iran's regime and the mullahs. But why did Saudi agree to such a deal with Iran? That is an excellent question. Uh, and, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to respond to the American public because I did a lot of op-eds in, in Arabic and on, on Al Arabiya and all that. So here's, here's the deal. Had there been a second Trump administration, let's start with our own politics. Mm -hmm. After the 2017 super summit in Riyadh, right? President Trump went with his cabinet and addressed 50 or 51 Arab and Muslim leaders. He called on the Saudis and on the rest of the Arab Muslim world to uh, drive the jihadists and the Iranian and Hezbollah out Iranian regime out of the, of the region. That was the peak. Of, of that, and I spoke with many Saudis, Emiratis, and even Israelis and, and others, and they believed that that moment was a crush between the past and the future. The energy was there, the vibe was there. My projection was, would have been, that in the second Trump administration, Saudi leadership and the Israelis, this government at least, would have signed an agreement, no problem. Why? Because the Saudis felt they had an umbrella, and that umbrella was the United States because it's a very serious matter if there is a confrontation in the region. How do you confront the Iran regime, which is backed by Russia and by China, and has the capacity of destroying the Gulf with their missiles? How? By having an alliance between the United States and whomever coalition of the willing in, in Europe, the Arab coalition with all the friends of the Saudis and the Emiratis, and Israel. And of course, the Iranian opposition. I wrote, I wrote many pieces saying the Iran opposition today is like the Gulf during World War II. You know, it has its capacity, capacity, and it's the only one that can help both Arabs, Israelis, and Americans at the end of the day to make the change. What happened was a change, a sudden change, but in our policy. The first month, the first few weeks after the Biden administration took over, what did they do? They delisted the Houthi organization, right. which is a terrorist organization, was on our US list of uh, terrorist organizations in Yemen. So we, we, we basically, Washington told the leadership of Saudi Arabia, we're not going to help you against the Houthis. And the Houthis are at 150 miles from Mecca and 200 miles from Medina. And they were bombarding Saudi Arabia with missiles, with ballistic missiles, and even the part of, uh, of the UAE and, of course, uh, Yemen. So that started to change the view of the Saudi. We don't have the support of the United States. Second pressure came by this administration to the Saudis, on the Saudis, and also their friends in, in, uh, in Congress, is to stop the war in Yemen, start talking to the Yemenis, uh, have a recognition of that role, engage in the Iran deal. So the Israelis at the time didn't have the tools. Actually, the Biden administration was even pressuring the Israelis at the same time, at the same time. So now the Saudis, their analysis was, okay, we can't do that super coalition to isolate Iran, it will cost. We don't know what the Biden administration is going to do. They saw what happened in Afghanistan, and that was crucial. When they saw that the US that trained and funded the army of Afghanistan overnight gave the power to the Taliban, mm, wait a minute, there is something not right here. And then came the Ukraine crisis. The Ukraine crisis, basically, uh, there was a crisis in oil price and everything. The Biden administration went to the Saudis and told them that was in Jeddah in 2000 and Two, they told them, we need you to control the price, produce more. Saudis said, fine, we will help you. And then the Saudis told the Biden administration, but you are talking to the Iranians. You are sending them money. You are sending money to our enemies and then at the same time asking us to help you. Right. No answer came and the conclusion was that the Saudis said, we need a respite, we need a ceasefire, we need to calm down the, the issue. We're not going with the Iranians. We're not gonna go against the Abraham Accord. They're still very committed, but we cannot do it alone before there is a change in foreign policy here. That's the, the logic. Now, 
I am very concerned. I was very concerned when they signed with the uh, with the Iranian regime. But since we don't have a policy on which upon which the Iranian and the Israelis and the and the Saudis can come together and create an alliance, I think they are waiting for the next presidential. Aren't we all? Uh, before I let you go, <laughs> before I let you go, though, um, I want to I want to end on a, on, a, on a, a hypothetical, but I do want to get your take on this. I think a lot of people are waiting to see if Saudi Arabia and Israel do normalize relations and and kind of can can work together more openly on on the world stage. Let's say you know the next administration. There's no change in Iran policy. God forbid. God forbid. Yeah, yeah. But let's say there is no no change in positioning. Would there be a scenario in which Saudi Arabia and Israel can work together to diminish the Iran regime issue? There was an incident yesterday, as a matter of fact, which was the Houthi, the allies of the Iranians, bombarded out of nowhere since the first time since the. Uh, the signing of the normalization agreement between Saudi and Iran, killing uh, Bahraini soldiers who were part of the Arab coalition on the borders of Yemen. I was on Arab TV this morning. Saudis are not happy at all. They start to smell that the Iranian position is not that real. So let me say two points quickly since we are getting to the end here. Number one, and that's very important, this leadership in Saudi Arabia is gonna start to do things with Israel things with Israel. There will be many normalizations right and left. You know how they started to do it before getting to the Abraham Accord? Yeah. Because the, the young leaders of Saudi Arabia, not just the, the Emir, the crown prince, but people around them, 48,000 Saudis were, you know, graduated from the United States. And if you look at the social media, they want to drive towards peace and the West and, and et cetera. But they are very careful. They're going to start the normalization. MBS himself said, our people are talking with the Israelis. And look, Look what the Israelis are saying. That's the most important one. They're saying, fine, we're going to keep going to Saudi Arabia. We're going to send our delegation. It's going to be economics first. It's going to be youth. The same thing they've done with the UAE. So a kind of a normalization is going to start. The timing of a full-fledged alliance that would reshift Saudi and the Arab coalition with Israel, that's left to both sides, to the Israelis and the Arabs and the Arab coalition. Things, things to look forward to are on the horizon in the Middle East. So you, you give Beyond us hope. The horizon, yes. <laughs> and, I, and I like to end on that note. There is hope. And when you look at the people of the Middle East, as many of your books talk about the people and their movements, yeah. that's what gives us hope. I encourage you all to pick this up because if this conversation is intriguing to you, it's just tip of the iceberg. This guy is filled with so much wisdom, so much knowledge, and truly the only one who can unpack these very difficult topics the way that he does. Dr. Ferris, an honor, a pleasure to call you a friend, to have you on the show. Thank you so much for your time. For those of you who would like to subscribe to our weekly podcast, go to youtube.com slash Lisa Daftari to sign up for our daily top 10 email to stay on top of all things foreign policy news. Go to foreigndesknews.com and you can sign up there. See you all next week.